so I'm kind of sad. This is my last day with you all till next month. And I'm going to spend two weeks down in Key West. Someone has to. <laughs> so what we've worked out, with Reverend Rose has worked out with the board and with me, is that I'll be coming in for two weekends a month and usually back to back. So that gives her two weeks off in a row and allows me then to go out and do two things um, in a row as well, no matter where they are in the country. So I asked Dixie to go get a revealing word for me so I can help us unpack that beautiful song. Thank you. Uh, this is what we've been studying. I said to Reverend Rose this morning, okay, this is now the second, only the second book that I think has changed my life. There's, of course, 150 others. But the first one being Discover the Power Within, which is written by Reverend um, Eric Butterworth. And this one as well. You know, I think I mentioned before I used to be in the steel industry and I published magazines in the steel industry and we always had one of those really big tabloid magazines um, in the day. And all of the business, and it was, so it was business to business. And all of the ones that the, were, were the regular size, you know, eight and a half by 11, we would say those are the how-to magazines how to, and I was in steel and copper, brass, aluminum, and, and all those. So how do you make it, and how to, what goes in it, and how, how, how. And the big tabloids were what with. So now that you have the metal, what do you do with it? And I think that both of those things are in this book. So you learn how your life can be different, how you can actually live. Yeah, I didn't know that maybe I haven't been living so much in these last couple of years. Um, you know, you kind of know it, but you don't really know it. And, and so then it also then tells you what, how to get there. So certainly how to do it with the tools you already have. It's not like you've got to go to the store and buy anything. You've just got to call it forth from within. You might call a friend. I might call Dixie and say, hey, I'm stuck here. Or, you know, can you help me pray? But basically, oh my gosh, and I now am going to lead a trip to go meet this man and to spend time with him. I don't know when that will be yet, but I know if we call ahead, then we can also have an appointment and see the, the grounds that he has and all that, and they are in um, Gainesville, not the other one. Um, I forget the, how distance the the distance between towns here. So we'll let you know when that's going to happen, but I think it's, if you continue to read it, and is Karen Cunningham here? Oh, I was going to have her come do an unsolicited testimonial because she has been reading it, and it's, she's having earthquakes as well. So we're, we're sharing this time together of, wow, oh, it's so easy. <laughs> Shoot, why didn't I know it sooner, you know, type of thing. So I wanted to look up the word Jordan. Okay, so this is the revealing word written by our co-founder, uh, Charles Fillmore. And what's so great about this book, when I first got into Unity, I was, you know, I guess I was a nerd, I'm not really sure, um, back in my late 20s, and I would just read this to figure out what do words mean so that I could understand better what they were talking about, all of this stuff that made so much sense to my soul, but I didn't get it up here. Um, and so you can look up here. I don't know if it's in here or not. We'll see. It might be in the uh, Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. Oh, and it is. So I will send out and I will give some information to Kim and she can put it in, um, in the um, bulletin. But what we do when we look at, at songs and things like that, um, so what, what some of the words were going home and what Charles Fillmore talks about going home, you'll hear that sometimes when you go into Unity Churches, welcome home. And people think, oh, this is because it's like a family where, you know, there's a family, so there's this home. No, the home is the truth of who you are inside of you. It has nothing to do with who else you're with. And so that's why you know, the shift in, in describing churches and spiritual places are community versus families. Because individually, we all bring with us our entire family. So I have six sisters and four brothers with me today, two moms and a dad. You know, so that's really who's surrounding me, plus grandparents and all of that. So the shift is, we, it says going home. So it's the truth within us, not something that someone gives you, although it might be friendly and it feels homey here. And then keep going there. She kept saying, keep going there, going to, you know, going to mother. Mother is our heart. 
mother is located in the feeling nature within us that usually we talk about is here. And father is the intellect, the, um, what we, we think is the thinking part of us. And then the savior. Mother, father, you, me, it's me. I am all of those things. And that's not about coming from the ego. And it's not about getting it from outside of us. So it's a perfect song. And I didn't know what you were singing. But that's what this book is all about. Quit looking outside of yourself. Quit having pity potties <laughs> that last a weekend. Let them be for an hour, you know. Invite all your friends over and we got one hour, set the timer, you know. And then get over it. It's like, oh, really? Well, kind of like to be like the victim part of us. No, let it go so that we can keep living. So we talked last week about um, non-resistance, which I think is probably the most important skill we can get. So if we're holding on to anything, even if it's good or what we might label bad, it's still blocking the energy flow of what might be coming to us. And Carlton Pearson, um, Bishop Carlton Pearson was, was the person who was the keynote at this retreat where Reverend Rose and I were in another 150 people. And he kept talking about, you know, why isn't, what are you keeping your bushel baskets on? Your heads for, unity people. You know, and he's going to be probably the foremost front person for unity, not even knowing you know, besides the Pope, what he's doing for us this week, each time he, he talks about it. But because Carlton Pearson had that awakening that, you know, there is no fire in hell and brimstone that we go to. We just cause it within ourselves each time we have those thoughts. So he really, you know, like shook, up, shook us up. He said that we're authorized and we're deputized to be all that we have come here to be. And so this non-resistance chapter Non-resistance leads to acceptance that leads to surrender that leads to peace. Would it be okay to be peaceful inside? Anybody want peace inside themselves? Okay. I'm going to hold up both hands for those of you who, who don't know yet. Okay. Because I know that's what you want. I know it's what you want. Or we can just keep going through life and know that, well, you know, maybe I should have, or if they should have, or I could have, or I would have. All we have is the now moment. All we have is the now moment. And so that's the truth. That's the truth of what that whole chapter is about. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we might want a group of us to meet once a month and continue talking about it. That's something that Karen Cunningham had suggested possibly. So we'll let you know. I'll talk to Reverend Rose and see what she thinks about it. Because if we can keep using these skills, we'll show up differently in our own lives, certainly show up differently here, which means there's going to be a shift in Merritt Island. And everybody better hold on right? Better hold on. Because the Pope was also talking about giving and being and doing, and that's what we are talking about here. And that's what the gift you've given, Reverend Rose, by allowing her to be gone for a whole month. I'm not telling you guys. I mean, ministers usually don't have the courage to ask for that, and then they just quit and go away. You don't want that, right? She's your spiritual leader. She's the one who feeds you. And so, bless you, bless you, bless you for that. She was kind of I would say, very proud that you could say to other people, oh, no, I've been on a month, month of th three weeks of, you know, month off. And people are like, what? She's like three weeks of vacation and this week of retreat because a lot of people don't ask for it. So um, that's my job. I go around and teach um, ministers how to ask for things. So the, the next chapter that we're talking about, so what we've talked about so far is unconditional happiness. Would it be okay to be happy every day? taking down the walls that we build, or what I, my friends call around me is plexiglass. I think they think that's nicer than a wall. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I get it. I certainly get it. You know, that removing the inner thorn, the thorn that's here, like, don't touch me because I have this thorn, but, you know, just pull the thorn out. Why not just pull the thorn out, Therese, you know? And then the roommate that's in our heads that keeps talking to us and, you know, just influencing us in ways that are so unattractive, really. Let's be honest with ourselves, right? Because then it shows up in things that are not necessarily pretty. So the chapters that we talked about this week, 17, 18, and 19, and the first one is con contemplating death. Everybody breathe. There was a great um, seminar day that Leslie was part of and um, Corey and, uh, and Andrew and to come and understand how do you prepare because really if you prepare for your death I'll just tell you from experience then it will leave your 
people who survive you in a much better place. You know, I couldn't even remember what Tom's social security number was, let alone where would you find that, you know, let codes and things like that. So if you can prepare, talk about it. Talk about it, get it out there so that it's not so scary. Because we said last week, the moment we're born, we begin to die. Because that's just the nature of humanity. It's the human condition. And so he says in here, if you live like you are facing death all the time, you will be more bold and open. I remember my Irish grandmother, you know, right off the boat from Ireland, she'd tell me, because she only lived till, well, she lived till I was 16, but she'd say to me, Teresa, and you are so bold. And I'm like, I know, Grandma. You know, <laughs> and like she wasn't, hello. You know, I was just like her. And, but that, I remember that being, you know, that as a name that she would call me all the time. And, she, and then, in, you know, towards her later years in life, she lived till 95, so I guess I got some good lineage. Um, you know, she'd say, continue being bold because even if you're faithing it till you actually are bold, you're going to be stepping outside of your comfort zone. And that allows you then to experience thing. If you live every life experience fully, then death cannot take anything away from you. But for me, death has always been, yes, yeah, like something's being taken from me. Now, I'm not saying I'm all, I'm there yet. I'm, I'm not there. That's why I'm thinking, you know, a month long, a year long study of this is probably going to be something really good. But it, it's time, you know, when souls die, even if they're puppies. It's time then for us to figure out how we can take the strength of our relationship with that person or that animal or whatever else it is and then apply it in their absence. And it's interesting because I don't know many of Tom's friends from when he was little. And for those of you who don't know, my husband passed 43 months ago today. Four and three are seven. And so I think we're complete. And I actually think I'm not going to have to talk about months anymore. It's really been that earth shattering. And yesterday I get on an email or a um, Facebook post that has a picture of this house. It's like, oh, well, okay, it's a house. And it's from this guy named John somebody. And I don't, it's on my page. And I'm thinking, I don't know this guy. And he said, this is the house that Tom lived in till he was, you know, 16 or something. And I'm thinking, oh, who is this guy? That he wouldn't, you know, so I, I dug a little bit and yes, they were sailing buddies and they built this the first time ever, this and that when they were in the Commodore Club and blah, blah, blah. But it was just this week yet again, reminding me that, and he said to me, thank you, I don't have any pictures of, of those, that time in his life, you know, they were, they were taken. And so he said, um, it's a relationship I will live every day to cherish. You know, I thought, well, I got to meet this. I said, so when I come to Ohio, can, may I meet you? <laughs> you who loved my husband as much as I did, you know. So how great, because I think if I had seen it even last, as last month, I might have been crying about it, right? So a different perspective on the gift. He spent his last 10 years of his life with me. I am all of that in two bags of chips, right? <laughs> it's a different way of looking at it. So death's going to happen. How will you prepare? And I know that the church is planning to have yet another one of those days come spring, I believe, right, Leslie? And so stay tuned, bring your friends, because it, it's just a great way of... That's what everybody says. And so we're going to charge $100. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I know. And we're going to you know, market it better to the community and into the other Unity churches. So once we accept the death part, which, of course, is like I'm saying, I, I don't have, there's nobody who can tell you how to do it. You'll just know. Um, the next chapter he talks about is being the secret of the middle way. So the yin and the yang symbol, symbol you know, the black and the white, the male and the female. Even most of my jewelry is silver and gold. And I was told metaphysically I'm really balanced. I'm like, really? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for letting me know. Um, because it, one represents the female and one represents the male, which means we have our head and our heart. That distance that Julia was talking about in the song. Can we be that? Can we be love and intellect? Can we be kind and tough love if necessary? And, you know, not so just black and white. Um, so balance. And that's true in most parts of life, isn't it? We need to have the balance. He goes on to say, we waste tremendous energy when we operate at the extremes. And yet the extremes offer valuable lessons. 
So how far are you going to go? Are you, you know, if you're kayaking, I was at the beach this morning, kayaking, and these people are in these waves, and I keep thinking, you know, when will I have the courage to get out there and be in those waves with those people? And they're pretty high because the moon's having its way with the ocean today, and tonight's the big blood moon and all of that. And so stuff is shifting. I think it's interesting that so much is happening in the world. The example he uses is that sailing talks about the the great dynamic balance. Now, I'm not a sailor because I tend to upchuck. I'm not fun to have on the boat. But he talks about being in the sweet spot. You must find the center of the tautness of the sail against the wind. And Reverend Rose used to be a sailor, so when I asked her this, she said, yes, that's it. You move from balance point to balance point, from center to center. So it's not just one center point we have within us. It changes depending upon which situations we're at. I get to go to another funeral this afternoon. (sighs) You can breathe with me, right? Because if we're going to live, we're going to die, right? So I'm having, you know, a talk with myself as I go because it was a friend and those are always a little bit harder and she chose to get her angel wings, if you know what I mean. So a little different on there. What could I have done as a friend and all of those things and yet nothing because it's her soul's journey. But I get to be in a different place of balance, and I'm not doing the service so I can cry and bawl and wail if I need to, right? <laughs> I don't have to be professional. And so look for those places in your daily life where you get to be balanced. Mom and dad all the time busy with the, with the kids. When do you get time for yourselves or for grandparents, right? Or for ucky people who are sticking their nose in your life. When do you just say, mm, I'm done with y'all? There was a sticker at Canuga this week that said, and blessed, wait, wait, oh, it's in my car, and blessed be with y'all too. (laughs) And I thought, oh, I'm going to send that up to one of my northern friends just to bug them, you know, because, you know, it's something that, you know, and blessed be with you is is a Catholic phrase that you do with each other. So then we, so we're balanced, we understand that we're going to die, we've already, uh, you know, agreed to having unconditional happiness in our lives, and then the reality, and maybe this could have been a chapter that was in the first part of the book. I don't know. You know, I'll talk to Michael Singer about that. Um, the loving eyes of God. Deep within us is a connection to the divine. We can consciously, he says, choose to identify with that connection rather than the psyche or what we call the personality. I never learned that until I got to ministerial school, and I was 43 when I went to ministerial school because I thought it was about me. But science has proven that we are hardwired for this connection to something greater than ourselves. And it's, you can call it God, Yahweh, you know, Buddha, all of those different names. You may just call it the great unknown, all that is, you know, living, loving presence, whatever you want to call it. We don't tell you that. But to know that, they're, that we're hardwired for that. He goes on to say, as you release the lower vibrations, so those are the thoughts of, <laughs> you know, woe is me, or they have this and I don't have that. So then you stop thinking that they are you. So as soon as those thoughts come in, whatever it may be, then you think, oh, that's just my thought. That's not the truth of who I am. I have friends who are traveling over in Spain, and so I'm jealous that they're in Spain and I'm not with them. But I don't have to, I'm not, the thought is of jealousy. I'm not coveting, you know, not coveting them. However, I don't have to be jealous, which would mean that I might be crabby and, you know, like all day long and all of those things. We don't have to be that. So you see the thought, you're aware that you're thinking it, and then you let it go. And maybe I'll make a a trip to go to Spain. I'm not sure. But I get to choose. Does it make sense? So as we let go, our spirit drifts upward. Now, we know spirit is all around, everywhere present. And spirits around our feet are not anything less than spirits around our head. It just is. But what we think of as we go forward and we go towards what we want as opposed to running from things, we think of going forward as an upward um, event. And even with the spiral that pulls us, it's continuously pulling upward towards our highest consciousness. So we're going to be having this sense of less association with the physicality of who I am, with the things that I have, and more with what's inside of me. More of the peace, more of the calm, more of the joy. As I was driving over the bridge 
thinking I'm going to get the best shots this morning as I get to the beach. No, the best shots were on the river for photographs because the, the um, sky was everywhere already engaged and I got to the beach and there were just dark clouds. But I, my destiny was the beach. That was what was in my mind. It had I stopped for a moment to be more of awe as I was looking both, you know, up and down the river, I might have never made it to the beach and really got some cool shots. Doesn't matter. I just, I'm aware that I'm aware, and that's what he's talking about. And getting out of the personality of, oh gosh, somebody might be expecting a um, picture from Therese. Well, get over it. You know, I can post something from yesterday if I want. Just be present. So the less that we're associated with the physical and the psychological parts of us, the more we identify with our energy. And our energy is the truth of who we are. We're a soul and we have a body. So one of the things I wanted to do to make this so great, besides our conversation that we'll have um, and our dialogue, is to have a little bit of a ceremony. So I'm going to, um, this is gonna be our burning bowl for today. So every, does everybody have a piece of, um, this is called flash paper. So get a pen, probably better than a pencil, and write something on there that, that you are willing to let, control, let go of, that you may not want to control you anymore, um, whatever that is. Something that you're willing to have non-resistance with, because that's the part. We get to choose. We know that there's going to be pain, but we're just not sure about the suffering, right? Because we get to choose. Three, did you say? There we go. So you can fill up both sides of it, or you can put one word on it. And what I'd like us to do, since we have just a little bit of time, is have you come up single filey, single filey. <laughs> How's that for grammar? In a single file line. Um, and in the silence, unless somebody feels like they might want to strum on their guitar or something. <laughs> hmm. Um, so you're go what are you willing to let go of? What is holding you down? What's tethering your soul to something or someone or some thought or you know, whatever it all is. So instead of declaring a truth, we're, we're, we're going to spend the moments letting go of that which no longer serves us. Flash paper works really great because there's no ashes, so there's no cleanup. We're going to do it in the silence, solemnly, I'm going to hold this. I'm going to stand down here. And so, on my piece of paper, you're, you're just, so there's just two little candles. You literally just let it, can't burn, it can't burn you. And it's gone. There is no ashes in here. So it's not like, oh, well, let me help you with those ashes. And then the people are like putting them in their pockets and saving them for labor. No, <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. And the great part of us witnessing for each other, like we do when we do the burning bowl, is if there is anything left, we've witnessed that it no longer serves you, and we will hold in our prayer time. Even if we don't know what it is exactly, we know the consciousness with which you want to let it go, and that's what we hold to be the truth. So, so close your eyes, and I'm going to take one blank sheet, and we'll let this be for all of those who aren't with us today and all of those other issues that are out there that we think are issues when really if we changed our mind, they might be gone. And so we, we see all of them gone. All we have is the light of the candle. So close your outer eyes for a minute and know that the light of God is you, that all you are is love. And when we show up less than that is when we know that our personality is involved and that we're tethered to something that's no longer serving us. And so the prayer might be, invoke in me the awareness 
of my untethered soul. Allow my willingness to step forward. Or a simple mantra is, I will to will the will of God. And so feel the lightness that is us now that we've let these things go that weigh us down. Whatever those thoughts are, doesn't mean the situation is no longer with you. It means you have a different attitude, a different consciousness, a different way with which you will deal with the situation, the person, the phone call. Because we get to choose. We are souls having a human experience that sometimes invokes a human condition into all that is great, all that is of God, all that is, we give you any of those things that tether our soul. We do that in this now moment. We know it to be true. And so we get to no longer talk of those things that were on your paper. And again, that agreement is between you and all that is God. So breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth and make a sound of exhale. And do it again. When we breathe like that, we are healing our bodies and, of course, healing our souls. And so I am grateful for this month of great healing that I've got as a gift from you all. One that doesn't need to stay in a drawer and will be continually unwrapped each time I look at this book. I am grateful. Thank you. Amen.